As a part of the oil painting series, this will be our next painting. It is mushrooms. Let's go over our photo reference and composition. Okay, we'll go over some of the photographs we're going to be using for this painting. Uh, this one here is just the reference image. So it's just right here, window under reference image. And then you just go to wherever your pictures uh, are saved at on your PC or Mac. Uh, this is the main image we will be using. And we're going to uh, take bits and pieces from other photographs. But what I want to do first is go over this one and just discuss the limitations of photography. It's very important to know. I like to classify my style of painting as lifelike and not photographic, uh, only because there is uh, quite a bit of, of limitations to photography. Uh, just for example, uh, this background is already out of focus, and that's only because I was shooting down at a 45 degree angle, so my depth of field was very narrow. Now some of the technical photography stuff I won't get into, but just to explain how the, it can have an effect on it. Uh, one example would be that when I expose for these mushrooms, I either have to expose for the lights or the darks. Now, the darks are down in here. They're already turning pure black. That doesn't mean they're black in real life. That's why I like to call my painting lifelike. Uh, the reason why is because when you set a camera to adjust for either the light or the dark, you have to either open up the aperture or close the aperture, depending on what you want to expose for. So if I want to expose for the lights and make sure all my uh, lighter areas of the photograph are properly exposed, then what I have to do is uh, close it down to cut back some of the light of the lighter areas, but then my dark areas will get real dark. And if you were there and you were looking at this picture, just remember that your eyes will immediately focus on what they're looking at, but then also immediately adjust to how much light they have to let in to either look at a dark or bright area. Whereas a camera lens is just set at one setting and that's it. It has to take one or the other, either for the lights or the darks. Now, if it was an HDR image that would stack images and uh, compensate for that exposure, uh, then that would be okay. But in this case, it is not an HDR image. So I can understand and know that my darker areas are, are going to be much darker than they really are. They will be borderline black instead of just uh, values of, of darker colors. That's why in some cases, I really do like the ability to take my own photographs to paint from. It just gives me a better understanding of actually uh, what is going on at the time and the conditions of what I'm photographing. Now, here's another photograph that I'm going to use, and I will pull it in. This one right here. Now, what this one is here, this is the original way it was taken, uh, this right here. And, and this is how it was photographed but we're going to use it this way. And then that way is what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this branch out of this picture and put it in this one. Now, all of these photographs we're going to use, we're going to pull one more in. They were all shot roughly around 50 millimeter. And that is very important because that's what the human eye sees. So then your proportions could be reliable when you use that type of a lens. Otherwise, if you start using real wide angle lenses, it compresses the picture. And there can also be some little bit amount of distortion also, depending on the quality of the equipment you have. Uh, for that reason, uh, you always can't trust your proportions in a photograph just because it's a photograph. You have to understand what millimeter it was shot at before it becomes reliable or not. With this particular picture here, what I'm going to do is take this branch out here and then put it down in here and add that to it because they're both all wet pictures. They're both somewhat overcast days. And you can see that they're all the same types of reflections off of uh, the wet areas that are kind of like the light, medium, gray blues that are, are being reflected in the wet areas. Here is our last picture. I will pull it in. And I may pull some of the leaves out of this one. But depending on where I want to put these leaves, say, for example, if I want to put them down in here, I don't know if I'll put this one in. 
I may put some of these leaves in here. The reason why is if I put that branch in, that's a specific kind of branch. That's actually a river birch. They're also called paper birch sometimes. Then I have to make sure, I want to make sure I put in river birch branches. Uh, leaves and they are also in here so if I pull out some of these uh, they would have to probably be down on the bottom if I put the leaves down here in the foreground because I'm, I'm looking down on them so I want to make sure my angle of view is the same so I don't want to pull any of the leaves up here from the top and be able to see the bottoms of them if I pull a leaf from up here and then put it down here it's not going to look right because my perspective is going to be off so if I pull leaves from down here and then put them down here, that would be okay. That would be roughly the same angle of view. And I can draw it even a little bit different too, but just keep in, in mind, we're only using all of these photographs just for an idea of reference to keep our subjects accurate. If I draw in any kind of branches or anything later, I may not have a photographic reference uh, to use for that. So what I may end up doing is just understand the branch as best as I can and all the details of it and what makes it a river birch branch and then freehand it in the way I want. As long as it's drawn in the way that the tree grows, then it will be an accurate representation of that tree. Now, with all that said, let's move on to the composition, and we'll talk about why we're taking the pieces of each photograph and putting them together and to just see uh, what will make up this painting at the very end. Let's move on to composition. Composition. Okay, let's go over how many different elements of composition we may run into with this particular painting. Now the first one that comes to mind, I'll grab my pointer here, and in this particular picture, this will be the main photograph we'll be working from, and then we're going to add bits and pieces to it to complete our painting. Now when I photograph this, this is going to be the first one, and that is what's called blocking corners. This corner is blocked, this corner is blocked, this corner is blocked, and then this corner is blocked. Now what that means is then because of this dark shape here, this almost right angle right here, these pine needles block this corner, these pine needles block this corner, and then these two mushrooms together block this corner, and then the top of this one blocks that corner. Now why that is important is what it does is it creates a, an elliptical movement through your picture or your painting that kind of creates a never-ending path for your viewer uh, to look and view at your piece. This way, uh, what it could do is uh, just uh, keep the center of attention through the bulk of the painting itself. Uh, now, I happened to do that when I photographed it, and I arranged it in a specific way, so that was already there. So, in other words, I will pretty much uh, paint it and draw it out just as it is here. But then uh, there are other elements, and let's go to them next. The next one would be color unity. Uh, I will show you why that's important also. And color unity is nothing more than the human eye will really uh, relate to a light colors. Now, you can see what's going on already just with all these pictures up. Uh, this one has quite a bit of color unity with this one. So if we pull one of these uh, leaves from the bottom, if we choose to put the leaf on the bottom, which would be in the foreground here, and that's what we'll end up doing, uh, then that way the perspective will be the same. I'll be looking down on the leaf here, and I'll also be looking down on a leaf in our new painting. Uh, but then as long as we take the right leaf, uh, the leaves that we're looking for are the river birch, which is commonly known as paper birch sometimes too. They have what's called a sawtooth edge, and some of these are smooth edged, which they can actually be considered choke cherry leaves, and that's not what we want. So in, in that respect, we have to make sure we pull out the right types of leaves if we're going to add and subtract. Now in this one over here, the color unity would be in this branch that you could see that we have colors such as uh, the potter's pink and the even the uh, some of the quinacridone golds in there. But we have to be careful with this particular picture because what it is doing is it is actually reflecting quite a bit of yellow right here 
from this leaf, and we're not going to have this type of leaf in our painting. So we have to watch what colors we grab off of this wet branch so they make sense in our new uh, painting. And then that way uh, it will look more like it's all tied together. Uh, but with the color unity, it, since the human eye does associate with the light colors, then all of these uh, bits and pieces will work really well together for that respect too, that they're all wet, uh, they're all on a, on a fairly uh, evenly overcast day, and, and they're all the same uh, tans and golds and, and burnt siennas uh, that we are looking for to tie the painting together. The next one would be uh, breaking like shapes. Now what I mean by that is we have a pattern going on here that's nothing more than a linear pattern from all the pine needles. So for example, if I take, and this is going to work several different ways, and I'll show you how. If I take a brush here and then go down, we'll actually, what we can actually do is actually, we'll make the background like a raw umber color. And then we will start that background like that. And then we will go to our quinacridone gold because that's the more dominant color of all of our uh, pine needles. And then we will grab, uh, just say for example, this bright now, let's go to just a flat liner here and we'll make it smaller. And then we'll start with our linear patterns. And these are just all the, the needles randomly in different directions, but they're pretty much mostly horizontal. And I just wanna quickly make a pattern here to show you what I mean by breaking like shapes, is that's kind of a biggie one. That will be probably the dominant element of composition in this particular painting. And whatever one shows itself the most is usually considered the, the dominant compositional element. Now we have a whole bunch of linear patterns here of needles. Now if I take these stems, even though they are linear, what they're actually doing is they are vertical. So now they are still a linear pattern, but they're the exact opposite direction of my pine needles. So what that is going to do is, is present them as the odd guy out. Now, again, if we look at these uh, shapes of the mushrooms, they're also odd guys out too. And if I take, just say, for example, my, uh, I'll take the white, and then actually just go in with this top here. It is now an elliptical pattern, but the shape is being reinforced by the contrast of the whitish blue. So it's definitely gonna grab our eye. And then this shape down here, which is this shape right here, and then there's a little wee bit of yellows and oranges down here. So I can even do that with the orange, but what that will do with the quinacridone gold, I should say, but then what I'll do is then if I finish these off, then these are the different shapes that I will be working with. And then because of that, they are completely different than my linear pattern needles. So for that reason, uh, they will present themselves as the actual subject. Now, if you want to kind of help yourself out and be honest with yourself when it comes to the composition and what is presenting itself as the subject. Now, usually most artists create the subject as the first thing you see, and that's what you could do. Just turn away from your photograph or your painting and give it a few seconds and then turn back. And then what is the first thing you see when you look at that piece? Chances are with this particular painting, it's going to be this guy right here. And that's what's going to actually be uh, the uh, actual eye grabber, uh, that it will actually be uh, the top of this cap right here, and then that's what will grab your attention. Uh, that if with that in mind, now there's other elements going on here too, and we will also go over them, but we'll take them one at a time. The next element of composition that we might have in this painting would be what's called Mama Baby Papa. I refer to it as that because it's just how it sounds. And what that will do is this is the papa, 
This is the mama, and this is the baby. One, it's great to work with odd numbers in, in the amounts of objects you're using uh, for your subjects or, or mixed background objects. And then two, it's also important to rearrange the sizes of them. And when you have a, a, a medium, large, and small, that helps in a sense that they will not be competing with each other. Uh, this is the first one you're going to see. Then the white cap of this medium one will be the next one you will see. And then the, the one down here buried kind of like back in the shadows may very well be the third one you see. But because of the size of the shapes, the contrast, and that they're breaking the like shapes of the pine needles, this will all reinforce uh, what we want the viewer to see and how. So when it comes to mama, baby, papa, then that will help us keep the uh, uh, elements or the objects from competing with each other. So in other words, just real quickly, if I actually have uh, more or less three circles, roughly the same size, then which one is my subject? But now if I actually make one this size and then one this size, and then one this size, then it's easier to see which one is going to be dominant and then how the progression will go. So that just helps out with the mama, baby, papa. Let's go on to the next one. Now, the next one would even be considered detail because detail is important. It's more or less just like if if you've ever seen anybody use a, uh, a strong uh, telephoto lens to take somebody's photograph and the background goes all fuzzy, then the sharp image of their face immediately grabs your attention because that's the only in-focus sharp object in, in the image. This is already the same thing. So what we're going to do here is because these pine needles are already soft and out of focus, your attention is going to go to all these fine detailed lines and all the script work within the mushrooms. But then if I change this background and make it a solid background, a soft fuzzy background, that will even reinforce that even more. That in other words, the detail will even become stronger with just a soft basic background. And then again, that will even help more reinforce reinforce your attention going to the mushrooms. Now that we have our composition figured out and how we are going to approach this particular painting, uh, let's go over some of the uh, techniques and tools and modes and different things we'll use uh, that we may need along the way uh, just to complete this particular painting. Now one quick thing I want to mention is actually uh, how I have my pen set up and I have my pen set up as the front rocker is number one and the back rocker is number four and that way I could immediately go back to my previous color and paint and then if I click the back rocker I will actually go to the blend mode and be able to blend my colors together. Now these adjustments will all be uh, considered and adjusted even whether I'm painting or blending. For example I have the quinacridone gold right here and I'll put some down and then we'll put some titanium white next to it because those are the two colors that are going to be used quite a bit. And I'll zoom in just a little bit just so we can see what we're doing. Now if I keep the loading way up then what I'll do is if I hit my back rocker then that's immediately my blend mode and what I'll do is start blending but because I have the loading set up real high it's going to be tough because I'm grabbing a lot of paint at a time to blend. So if I start cutting back the loading, then I can actually start blending much quicker in the sense that I won't be grabbing as much paint at a time and it'll allow me to blend faster. And then that way, depending on how big of an area I am going to be working on, uh, I will adjust those as I go. And then this way, uh, this is a transition from this color to this color but I may put down more than just two colors. And all I'm doing is actually using my canvas as a palette. I will be mixing the colors right on it as I go. Now, if I actually take the pressure down too, even though this pressure uh, adjustment right here is for those who have a mouse or a pen that's not pressure sensitive, 
I could still use it because if I take it the whole way down to zero and then if I press real hard, I'm not blending at all. So it does have an effect on my particular pin uh, just because it's down to zero. So if I take it up and, and uh, use it just a little bit of time or adjust it incrementally, then what I could actually do is kind of then just dust the colors together and I could really fine tune my blending uh, depending on how big of an area I'm working in. And then this way, it will actually uh, also give me a different effect that you could see that the canvas is starting to come through more too because there's less pressure. So depending on what effect I want, if I want this effect, I have to actually take the uh, pressure all the way up and then that way what I will do is then go back and get this effect up here and then blend these together and all I am doing is pulling one color into the other and this is just pretty much a straight edged uh, actual brush too so it's a little bit more of a challenge to subtly blend them together. I can use different brushes as I go depending on how I work and what effect I want. But the uh, other important thing would be to note is if I keep my loading up and if I just grab the uh, quinacridone gold and pull it down into my white if I just keep grabbing yellow and pulling it into the white, then I'll just keep on moving my yellow uh, right across the white and not blend at all. If I actually then take the white and take it back up into the yellow, then I will actually keep on using my white and mixing it and not really, well, actually just moving it and not really mixing it unless I actually go back and forth from one color to another. And that's what will give me the quickest blend. And then also if I want a subtle, more subtle blend, then I can actually uh, take the loading down and then mix them a little bit more subtle together and have a much better, quicker transition from one color to another. Now, if I use the dirty brush, I won't be using that in this particular painting. But just a quick note about the uh, the dirty brush, what it will do is just say, for example, if I grab my cobalt violet, it will keep on using and holding the last colors that you used. So if I go back in and grab the quinacridone gold, then now you can see and then go back in and just say a, a different color, the purple, then what it'll do, and then here is the unbleached titanium, what it will do is it will retain every color you use. So if you keep on uh, holding your previous colors, that is okay if you're working in a specific area. But then if you want to change your colors completely, you may want to turn the dirty brush off because you'll keep those colors within your brush and you may not want those particular colors in your new object. So for example, if I start working with greens or anything like that down in here and I don't turn the dirty brush off, I'll be taking my greens up into the uh, mushrooms and I may not want any greens in it. Now if there is greens in it, that's fine, but if not, then I may want to turn the dirty brush off. But for me and this particular picture, what I will actually be doing is just controlling what colors I mix together and then laying my colors down as I go and then mixing those together on the canvas as if it was a palette. What we could go over next is the visual settings and that is uh, these right here. And what I have is the impasto depth set at 5 and the gloss set at 10. And just to give you a rough idea what we're going to be doing with that. Now I'll go over these in more detail and show you a good example. What I'll do is paint two different backgrounds and then compare the two and see how they affect the mushrooms uh, if they're a positive or negative depending on which background I use. And that will again uh, determine with our composition how it will lend itself to that. Now if I actually take the uh, pen and what I'm going to do is I will show you that even though I have these settings here as 5 and 10, that is a, a pretty thick gloss that's the highest it'll go and then a medium setting for the impasto. And what that will show us is if I say, for example, take a, a heavy, uh, just uh, let's see, which one? Thick, dirty. Um, we'll go with this one here. Now, this one is a real 
uh, real uh, smeary type brush. I will go with the, well, we'll leave the red on there. And then if I actually uh, take the size up and then the pressure, I'm going to put all the way up. And then you'll see that it's going to actually uh, be a nice brush as far as how it, uh, it works and smears together. But then that is all the impasto depth and the gloss that's giving me those settings and that look. But now keep in mind, if I go back to the original brush I was using, then that is still uh, going to be just smooth and and uh, I will zoom in and just real light, but then you could see how the canvas texture is still coming over. But if I take this thin brush over this thick paint, you could see how it's trying to smear it and smudge it and move it out of the way uh, just as if it was real oils. And if, depending on how much pressure I put on it, it's either going to really mix it or it's really going to uh, just kind of like skim across it. I'm barely putting pressure on it now, and but it is changing the brush strokes of the cadmium red. Uh, now, what I wanted to show you that is, is that is going to be also the way the brush settings are. And if I grab other colors, then they're still going to stay flat if that's the way I have the brush set. But now later on, what we'll do is we will adjust these settings to actually even get rid of the uh, actual uh, paint texture itself, no matter what type of brush you use. And then that way, uh, we will go over that to see uh, whether or not uh, that will be uh, a change uh, for the better or worse, depending on what kind of background we use. But now if I actually, I'll zoom out a little bit here. And then just because I have these heavy paints working here, if I grab a heavy knife uh, and then use it, then this is the effect I'll get with the white. If I go to the yellow, I'll get that effect with the white. And I'm barely touching. So what I'm doing is I'm leaving a lot of paint down and smearing. If I press real hard, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a really flat look to it because I am actually pressing hard and it's pushing the paint. But... If I build up all these different ridges and then go back and use my knife that's thin and I will cut down the size just so we can see what's going on and go to a different color, this potter's pink. If I bring it out across here, then that's the effect I'm going to get. It's just going to skip across all the highs and low areas of the previous paint I put down and that will create a very unique look as far as how the oils will actually work. This way, if I want then I can actually uh, go up to the other one, and this is the heavy one that will put down heavy paint. I'll make it smaller again, and we'll go to the French Ultramarine, and then it's going to put down a real heavy uh, layer of paint on one side, but then it's going to skip on the other side. Now, I'm not going to use any knives for this particular painting because it's going to be a fairly detailed painting and we're going to do it uh, just as an il illustration, almost like a textbook type illustration. But I do want to show you what different effects you could get uh, with some of the oil brushes. Now these are all the oil brushes I use and that's it. I don't use any other ones and they will give me all the effects and all the rendering I need to do with any texture I need to actually come across. And then you'll actually see towards the end, I'll even construct a very uh, artsy looking background, so to speak, uh, with some of these brushes. And that would be these right here, the smudge heavy, and then also the smudge skip. And that one will actually give me a look, but it's in a mix mode right now. If I put it down as paint, then that will give me a very unique look as far as what my colors are going to do when they blend together. And then if I start blending them, this is what I will get, a very heavy paint look. And then uh, this is what we will try to do our background with uh, later on, just to see how it will work with the actual uh, mushrooms. So with that said, and uh, everything uh, talked about with the uh, tools and the techniques we're going to use, uh, let's get started, and then we will definitely uh, stop on the way and discuss our progress as we go. Okay, just starting out with the mushrooms, drawing them in, 
and then I'll work down into the stems. It didn't take too long at all to just sketch this out. Working in the uh, river birch branch, and then I transformed the entire shape uh, just to readjust the proportions and to center it up a little bit better than it was. Uh, then also now I'm just working with the quinacridone gold, laying it down on the unbleached titanium. This is the very uh, early stages of just roughing in my shapes and forms and starting to lay down the multiple colors uh, where I'll blend in several colors together, uh, all built up on that unbleached titanium base. When I start doing the uh, branch itself, I'm putting in the colors one way, but then I'll blend the opposite direction because a river birch has a very horizontal pattern to the bark, and I want to establish that early. Now just roughing in the very early stages of the dirt and some of the pine needles that will be at the very base, uh, I will go over those because of the texture of the paint, and then I'll just start roughing in the background just to give me something to work by as far as values and color. Okay, here's where we're at so far. I just went ahead and grabbed my pointer uh, just to go over a few things here quickly, uh, just to catch up. And that is, I put the background on its own layer so we could duplicate it over and then create another one uh, just to compare the two. And then also, what I did was also put the pine needles on their own layer uh, just so I could use the transparency lock and give them a very subtle spotted texture uh, which they have. Uh, but now what I want to also uh, show you is with the pine needles themselves, I actually used a different type of brush to make various different pine needles. And what I did was I got some texture involved. And you could see that because of some of the darker, more recessed pine needles, they're still protruding out because of the gloss and the texture of them. Even though these burnt sienna needles are above these darker ones in the background, it still almost looks like the ones with the thicker paint and the uh, oiliness of the shine is trying to come out uh, even more uh, than the ones that are on top of them. So I am going to go back and change those completely. And then also the birch branch itself, I also put it on its own layer uh, just so I could use a transparency lock when I start giving it textures and uh, different colors that that way then I could just concentrate on working on it and then that's it. Otherwise, uh, we will uh, actually get some more done here, but first I'm going to completely replace all these pine needles. Okay, I'm just working back into the birch branch. And what I'll do is keep on going back and forth. Uh, just uh, redefining my shapes first, uh, if it's a cylinder or if it's uh, a circle sphere, uh, whatever the case may be, and then I'll refine the detail on top of it. And right now I'm putting this uh, unbleached white, uh, the very subtle patterns of the, of the uh, mushroom stems on their own layers, and that way I can control uh, whether I uh, shadow them or whether I even erase some of them uh, to lighten it up towards the base. But I want to control that later uh, as I get closer to being done. Because uh, what I will do is then uh, decide how dark something should be, how light something should be. And the most important thing is when I put those kind of designs on their own layer, then I can even use the transparency lock uh, just to be able to work with just these white shapes I'm putting down now and nothing else. And sometimes that is what I would want to do uh, to be able to just work on specific areas at a time. And then right now, as I do those very subtle white uh, designs uh, and texture, uh, I'm actually blending the bottom uh, of each white space in uh, at, at a time. I have uh, still one more to do, but what I will do is actually uh, bounce back and forth throughout the painting uh, just to actually give me a break on some areas. Uh, but this way, uh, I will now uh, actually go back down in and start working on the uh, the birch branch itself. And then what I'm doing is actually starting to lay out more dots, more detail of the, uh, the wet water look on the branch, and then slowly work my way into uh, what the, the very bottom pine needles will be. And what I need to do is trying to create a space uh, within the pine needles to make it look like that branch uh, is in a particular area of where the pine needles are not because I am also trying to create a spot in the pine needles where the mushrooms push their way up through. 
So how I uh, do all that is very important to the actual uh, painting itself and how accurate it is and, and whether the actual painting makes sense or not. Because I can actually have all the detail in the world, uh, but if it falls apart as how the painting should actually be working with the branch next to the mushrooms, then all the detail won't mean too much. It'll be an inaccurate painting. Uh, but otherwise, uh, now what I'll do is just uh, put in more dirt values. I did add the color sepia to get me darker faster than just the raw umber. Uh, and then what I'll do is start laying down the very base coats of needles and work from there. Okay, just a quick update. Uh, what I wanted to show you is just a couple of things. I just started putting in the very base of the pine needles, the ones that you'll barely be able to see. Uh, but if you look close enough, you'll see them. But once I start uh, putting all kind of burnt sienna, quinacridone gold, and even maybe some orange ones uh, that, that have a texture to them, uh, you'll be able to see these down through the, the open gaps of all of those pine needles. Now, what I want to do is actually get to the point where I want to block off this corner right here. So what I'll do is I'll get my sepia and my uh, raw umber and start to just paint over and disguise this edge of the branch here and then start putting pine needles over them. Uh, so you can only see bits and pieces of the branch down here in this end uh, and then they'll slowly be covered up by all the pine needles. Uh, but now what also I wanna do is show you that these pine needles right in here, since they're standing up, you're almost seeing pretty much the shadowed side because the light is coming from back here uh, and up, uh, up high because of the reflection off of the tops. Uh, so I will keep these darker and then you could see that back there is the flat blanket of pine needles that are reasonably lighter than these down in here because you're on the shadowed side. Now what I want to say about that is this right here, right now this stem looks pretty light compared to the background, but that's only because my background has to go quite a bit lighter. Uh, what I'll do is I'll start off with a darker background than I need and then start slowly putting the, the pine needles on them. Now I'm only gonna take pine needles maybe up into here, halfway up, and then we'll just blend this into whatever. Uh, but with the lighter pine needles back there, it'll change the look of the stem a lot. And we could even verify that by just turning the background off. Now look how dark the, the stem looks compared to the white background. Now it won't be completely white, it'll be darker than white. But again, I said it before, you can't have light without dark and you can't have dark without light. So what I mean by that is that your stem uh, is going to uh, very much depend on what colors are around it, whether it looks dark or not. So with that in mind, uh, I, I need this stem to look a little bit darker uh, than what it appeared to with that dark background because right now if I turn the background on, now the stem looks pretty light and it doesn't even look like it's in the shadows for the most part. It looks like it's, it's glowing light. So now once I get my uh, pine needles in in the background and how light they'll be, will determine whether I will actually darken or lighten the stem. It's pretty safe right now, but I'll leave it go for now until I start getting other colors involved. Uh, with all that said, let's get some more done. Okay, I'm just going back in and uh, reworking uh, some of the very fine textures of the uh, mushroom on the left side and then just working in the detail. I'll use the cerulean blue to uh, just give a hint of where some of the places might be wet uh, and then reflecting the skylight, uh, darkening up the stems. I'm going to just slowly try to set them back into the hidden areas of the picture to where you'll barely, barely be able to see down in them. Uh, this way, uh, it will help establish depth uh, of some of the things that you'll barely be able to see uh, through just multiple layers of, of uh, the pine needles themselves. And then again, I will have to determine uh, what needles will be under the branch, what needles will be even hanging right into the branch, so to speak, same level, and then what will be hanging over the branch uh, down in the lower left-hand corner. Now, establishing some of the pine needles in a distance, Again, I will probably just bleed those off into the, uh, the distance. I don't think I'm going to take pine needles all the way off the top of the picture. Uh, and then that way, uh, just create just an illusion of pine needles going on forever and slowly blend them into maybe a solid color. But remember, I have my background set as the very base layer. 
and uh, that way I could go back in and change things around if I want to make it lighter or darker uh, or even just experiment with the uh, actual uh, opacity of it also uh, but usually I will just actually repaint it if it's the only layer uh, that will be affected by those color changes now I'm just going back into the detail of the uh, the smallest mushroom and what I'm trying to do is just establish uh, very subtle textures uh, and uh, hills and valleys so to speak uh, and I'll go back in and put some highlights on them and then blend that back in and it's just a question of refining your shapes over and over uh, working in the foreground I just put some hints I didn't make the uh, base color uh, solid I actually streaked it here and there so that adds to the depth effect uh, and then now what I'm doing is starting to layer on my uh, very uh, pine needles that will be barely be able to see them but the ones I'm putting in now I wasn't happy with the size of them so I actually took them out and made them larger okay just to leave this enlarged the way it was uh, what I'll do is actually uh, just take a look at some of these pine needles. Uh, they actually still may not be large enough. I want them in scale to the size of the mushrooms, and they will definitely have a scale. Uh, making these uh, pine needles, the final layers, the final sets that will lay up on top, uh, should be a specific size and even a specific thickness. And once I start doing those, those are the ones that I'll use my transparency lock over here and then start spotting the little wee tiny spots on them because now they'll be big enough to see that. But more importantly, those will also be the ones on top. There really wasn't too much of a point of, of doing them, uh, most of the ones that will be covered. But if I do decide to take these out and make the pine needles even larger, what I might do even is actually take that layer and enlarge it through the transform tool and see if I like them better. Uh, if I can leave them that way, then I will just leave them that way enlarged from the transform tool. If not, it's uh, uh, just a few minutes work that I can actually just make them larger. And for me, uh, in some cases, I may always even make an improvement here or there if I have to do something over. I went ahead and used the transform tool to make some of those foreground pine needles larger. I wanted to keep them in actual a scale to the mushrooms uh, this way uh, if the pine needles were too small they were making the mushrooms look way too big because those are white pine pine needles and they're kind of long and floppy uh, what I did then after that was make my brush size up to 18 so all the needles I were making after that I had my new width of the pine needle but it was still up to me uh, to make what length I had to make to keep them in proportion with the width of the pine needles. Now I'm just working on actually the textures of the mushroom heads going back and forth and adding more pine needles. Uh, what I'll do is just build them up. These burnt sienna pine needles I'm putting in now those are the ones that have been there for several years and they are more decayed than the very top ones but what happens is when the mushrooms grow and they push up through all of them they'll bring up some of the old decayed uh, pine needles from long ago and, and then uh, they are exposed now too but they are definitely not the same colors as the ones that just fell we'll talk about a few more too that are just green and just turning uh, like the orangey uh, burnt sienna colors also we may add some of those at the very end now I'm just roughing in just some of the uh, actual details of the mushroom caps themselves this would be kind of like a typical illustration uh, of an animal or a plant uh, just to have identifiable features that someone may be wanting to tell what type of mushroom it is and nothing further it's meant to just be a clean illustration for identifiable purposes. We'll do this one last update before we finish this one up and then have a closing comment and that would be it. Uh, one type of illustration would be this and that is to, to combine several photos that one photograph may not have enough information in or you can elaborate on something by piecing different things together. The important part is, is to keep everything in context of what you're actually uh, taking out of each one. Uh, again, we took the river birch out of one and then put it in with the mushrooms the other. Uh, something that both photographs didn't have was just a combination of both of them. But now what we can do now is just go back in and actually clean up our edges 
uh, we have a little bit to do. We have the whole entire top of the bigger mushroom to do. And then I will actually go back in and refine some of these shapes. And if I feel some of the yellows are too strong uh, or jump out at you a little bit too much, then I'll tone them down a little bit with some actually uh, quinacridone gold. And then I have a little bit of work to do on this one yet. So it's just going to be the fine touches of just cleaning up and finishing up. And then I will also add a little bit more contrast like you can see right in here. I'll need some more contrast in this area right in here uh, moving down into the raw umbers. Uh, then that way, uh, this one, I will actually uh, add some more pine needles at the base. And I may end up with even the, uh, starting with the values of, of the quinacridone gold, and then even maybe moving on to actually the cadmium orange as my base color. And then you can even see some of them here are even a little bit yellow, but then there's also some uh, more of a whitish ones. That, that are wet but having uh, reflecting the skylight uh, quite a bit. Uh, they are kind of washed out. But what I did want to point out was this one right here. Uh, I'm kind of uh, unsure whether I want to put that one in or not. It's a green uh, set of needles that is probably one of the newest ones that just fell off the tree, and it's just starting to turn that cadmium orange burnt sienna color. But putting green into this particular picture uh, might be pretty tough as far as I don't want the, the uh, oddball color out to be the subject that any uh, color that's not in here to begin with, such as a hard green. When I had the grass in, it, it was pretty eye-grabbing, even as small as it was. Uh, and I could kind of put greens here and there as like the grasses and maybe some of the fresher pine needles. But I don't know if I might even just leave the greens out and then just have this more as a a deep forest with very little greens or very little new growth uh, as far as where these mushrooms might grow. Uh, but with that said, uh, we will go ahead in and finish this one up. And then again, as long as we have uh, the background separate from everything else, we could go back in and make it artsy for a different type of application. But in this particular case, uh, it would probably be uh, even better just to keep it a, a somewhat simple background to put the emphasis on the mushroom and possibly what type of mushroom it is. And then that, that way uh, all the uh, emphasis will be on the mushrooms themselves and, and their surrounding area and supporting uh, subjects that go along with them. Well, let's finish this one up. Okay, I'm just refining the top of the mushroom starting to put in the very subtle shades and the very subtle lines at the top. Uh, what I'll do is just keep on going back and forth again and keep refining my objects and my shapes uh, with lights and darks to slowly take it to where I want. Uh, this way, uh, it gives me a chance to look back and see how everything compares to everything else. Because uh, it, it's almost you have to take it as a whole when you're looking at it as a painting. And when I start zooming in, to do detail, then I don't want to lose uh, what the actual whole painting does uh, as, as, as an entire piece. Uh, right now, I'm just putting in uh, some of the uh, dead leaves that have been maybe there for a while, and they've already blackened up, and they're already underneath uh, several layers of uh, pine needles. This leaf I'm putting in now, I put it on its own layer so I can actually uh, leave it as is, or maybe move it around, uh, adjust the size, uh, or even eliminate it altogether. Again, this is all for composition and how, I, in a digital form, I don't have to commit to too many things if I don't want to. If I leave them on their own layers, then I can adjust things as I go. The orange pine needles I'm putting in now, those are the ones that are going to be one of the top layers of the pine needles. Uh, this branch I'm putting in now, uh, the thing about this type of a branch and this type, I really could never find a photographic reference that would show me a branch exactly like I need it. So in this particular case, what I would do is actually understand and really learn how this branch would look. It's just, again, another uh, river birch branch, but so I know how the branch is and what it what it looks like up close and some of the markings that make it that type of a tree. 
Then what I'll do is draw it however I want, providing it is like that tree grows. But then this way, I can establish my own branch in space, whether one branch is going behind the mushrooms, another one is coming in front of them, and whatever it's doing. And then what I'll also do is then really decide what parts of the branch are laying on the ground, what parts are kind of coming up off the ground a little bit and then going back down. And that will all be done with the illusion of where I put the further pine needles uh, so then that way it'll look like they are on top of the branch and, and not just floating in space. There I changed a uh, overlap of the branch just to make it look like it was the opposite direction. And we'll go over that at the very end quickly. Some of the real fine spots that make up that river birch branch are very subtle textures. And then I also put in a second background that we will discuss as a choice. Okay, I think we're just about finished. And now that I'm looking at the painting, uh, we've added the branch and a few other things. And I went ahead and put in some of the uh, greenish pine needles, but I think we could tone those down a little bit. They're a little bit too bright. And I think we can even work with those with the filters. But now the background itself, I think... It's a little bit too busy uh, for the texture of my mushrooms. I think it's actually competing with them. And now, especially the visual settings, just to show you the difference, what is going on here is actually the um, settings right here, the gloss and the impasto depth. The gloss is showing a very high hard reflection on all the edges of the paint that are kind of going this direction. If they go this direction, then they're not going to show uh, pretty much like down in here. They're not going to show too much of a reflection at all. Just the edges that are going kind of diagonal this way, but they will also show quite a bit more uh, in the darker areas. Now, just to show you what a change this could make, I will actually uh, keep it about right there, and then I will take the gloss all the way down to zero, and then you can see how much of a difference this already made. It toned it down quite a bit. It got rid of the white reflections of the glossiness of the oil, but there is still the shadows there that still gives a good bit of the texture. Now, if I want to eliminate that, then I would actually just take the impasto depth all the way down to zero too. Now, it flattened up the paint quite a bit, but to a certain extent, it's still busy, and that is uh, there is a, a lot of uh, strong edges here and there that are kind of okay, but I wonder in this particular case, uh, it is artsy, but then I really don't have the rest of my painting artsy. It's kind of just more detailed and more precise uh, with a fairly loose background. So for that reason, I don't even know if they go together well. Now, if I went back and turned this one off and then turn my original background back on, I think I actually like the looks of this one better. And just the way it goes uh, together is a little bit more safer. But then it also uh, really uh, pronounces the actual uh, mushrooms themselves, especially with the white caps up against the darker background. Now, the only thing else I could see here is just a couple of the things. This particular pine needle set I, I painted right here, um, instead of them looking foreshortened, they almost look like they're laying up on edge. And for that reason, I could go back in and find those. And that would be just the yellow pine needles right here. I could verify them. Yeah, that's them. And then now what I would do, though, is actually go back in, grab my eraser, go to my sharp edge, and I could take it down in size. I want the opacity the whole way up, but I could take it down in size and then actually just zoom in a little bit. And I'm going to get rid of some of these just to actually make them look more like they were laying on their side. I think that's a little bit better. Now, this one here has pretty much the same issues. But I think what we could do with this one is just take it out altogether. I'll make the size a little bit bigger and then just take it out completely and then leave that one go as is. Now that, I think that looks a little wee bit better just to clean things up. But then now also, uh, since we clean them up, 
what we could also do is actually go up since we're already on that layer we could go up and actually go to the filters and then hit hue and saturation and i'll move this out just so we can see what's going on and then what i will actually do and and just change the lightness and i would say about right there because what that's doing is toning down the green and then the uh uh the also the yellows they're toned down a little bit now and it just made them darker and uh what i actually did was was uh uh just darken them up and then give it a negative lightness which actually uh, does look better I think they're still greens and yellows but they're toned down and I would leave them right there and then I think because these are in the background these back here these couple uh, green and yellow ones I think I'll also do that and I think that is this layer too right there yeah that's them there they are okay now what I would do with these is the same thing go back up to the filter and hit the hue and saturation and now this is where it was with just the ones we just did. And that ain't even too bad. But I think I could take it down even a little wee bit more. Make them just a little wee bit darker. Since they're further back, their contrast would even be less than the ones in the front. And I could take them back a little bit further. But then you could still see the hints of greens and yellows of the fresh pine needles that just fell. But they're nowhere near as strong as when I put them in. And being that this is digital, we could easily uh, use digital to our advantage. I would leave them there. And that would be it for those. I'll apply that. Uh, this is the layer I think we need right here. Yes, that's them. Now what I would do then is go up here, grab my soft brush this time. And then leave it way down. And then leave the pressure right where it's at. I don't need to worry about whether it's wet or not. Uh, but then what I'll do is take this up and then what I can actually do is just dust over them and I'll zoom in a little bit just so we can see what we're doing and then just dust over them just a little wee bit and then that way that will make the transition from the foreground pine needles to the background pine needles a little wee bit more subtle yeah, that looks better. And then we'll do the same thing on this side. Take them down just a little wee bit so you can just barely see them. And that would be it. And with that done now, I don't see anything else. This leaf I picked here, I picked out of that third mushroom picture of just a single mushroom. But I picked that particular leaf out because it has a more linear pattern to it, a linear shape. Uh, whereas the one that was in the original photograph was a little bit more on the uh, oval side. So I thought I'd just try one like this and use it instead. And again, since it's on its own layer, we could even just take it out. Uh, but that... Uh, having options is a great opportunity that when you start getting pretty busy with a lot of things then you could definitely take them out or leave them in or even move them around at the very least but way that's set right now I would actually consider this one done and I would leave uh, the original background in because I think the uh, artsy background is a little bit too busy uh, for the mushrooms so this one would be considered done just the way it is. And that would be it for this one. So until we see you out in the field or at the studio, thanks for watching. <music>